We'll have a conversation on the topic from the streets to the internet and back. Does digitalization play a decisive role for modern protest movements? And uh, I'm happy to welcome our two experts. We have with us Dr. Rio Asapanya. He's a uh, uh, hello. He's hello. the director of the Belarus Initiative at Chatham House in London and also the founder and research director at the Center for New Ideas in Minsk. Welcome very much. And we have Espen Gilman and Rudd with us. He's a researcher at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at the Uppsala University in Sweden. If you're expecting Lena Atala, she was unfortunately um, unavailable today. She had to cancel short notice, but I'm sure we will still have a very wonderful conversation with the two experts here. Let me start with you, Rior. Um, I mean, the protests in Belarus are ongoing. We're all reading about it on a daily basis in our newspapers and online. Um, and uh, from the outside, just following it from last summer, it seems uh, like the protests couldn't have reached the nationwide scale in such a short time span without social media. Can you tell us a little more how it started and developed and what role social media played or still play to this day? Sure, thanks a lot. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think that even two, three months before the election day, it was obvious for many people that this election will be really unique. And even in June or in late of May, it was obvious that it will be very difficult for the regime to still have the same level of legitimacy after the election as it had before the election. And so this election was unique for a number of reasons and maybe social media is an important issue, but there were many other issues that I think that I should say and cover before going into speaking about the social media. And uh, I think that I will speak about three main issues. Lukashenko's unpopularity, strong uh, involvement of the society and the appearance of the new alternative politicians or candidates. And the first one, why actually this election was really unique. It was unique because Lukashenko lost it. And it was an important issue because all previous elections, he of course falsified, there were many frauds during the election day, during actually the election week, because in Belarus, the election day lasts for, for, for a whole week. Uh, but actually Lukashenko won previously the elections. This election was unique because he had a low accept, uh, approval rating. And while he has hit his statistical lows before, it never happened during the election. And uh, Lukashenko's popularity can be explained simply by the fact that he is perceived as a person who is, who he, he was, and he is no, no longer able to actually to cope with uh, his responsibilities. And uh, for example, during the last 10 years, the average wage or in Belarus was around $500. So, and it is pretty the same right now. And uh, in this way, despite all previous uh, Lukashenko's promises, he wasn't able to deliver economic growth for the country. He was no longer able to actually to, uh, to give people the sense that actually the country is developing. But what is maybe the most, the most important issue was that he, he actually wasn't able to take adequate measures during the COVID pandemic, during the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And many Belarusians were left feeling that actually the state couldn't care less about Common people, uh, the authorities did very little to support uh, people, to support businesses. I guess that many of you actually heard that he said many uh, weird uh, 
made many weird statements that sauna can heal the the uh, coronavirus that actually you should dry up your tractor and that will help you to survive during the pandemic so there were many weird statements that made very clear to the society that actually Lukashenko is not able to be present uh, and he's no longer able to actually to be responsible as a president. Uh, and uh, in fact, many of these things uh, can be also explained by the fact that actually society became uh, quite different from Lukashenko. For example, the Russians became quite liberal economically. Many people are thinking that actually the private sector is a huge uh, stimulus for the growth of the economy, while Lukashenko is still believed and believes that state-run enterprises are super efficient because he actually, they are super efficient for him because it's very easy to actually control voters through these large state enterprises. Uh, the second important change was that there was a stronger involvement of citizens in politics. It was even before the election that actually, uh, it was two, three months before the election that public actions on both large and small scale took place in a very, across the whole country. And even in this very small towns where actually no mass protests have ever happened. And uh, there are many reasons why this uh, people's involvement has increased. Because actually people uh, were disappointed with Lukashenko, but there was actually the fact that actually there is an entire generation that grew without knowing, uh, without experience of police repressions. Uh, because before the election, everybody knew that, well, we live in a dictatorship, uh, but at the same time, the level of repressions during the last five years, it wasn't very high. Belarus had several political prisoners, but actually right now Belarus had more than 450 political prisoners. But before the election, like six months before the election, we had like one, two political prisoners and, uh, and repressions in general were quite low. So people were not afraid to participate in politics during this summer, and uh, that's why they became more and more involved. And now we can start speaking about this social media. And uh, actually, many people are very focused on Telegram, but I think that in general, internet played a huge role uh, in uh, Belarusian revolution. And we can sp start by speaking, for example, from YouTube, because in Belarus, mass media, they were actually dominated by the state, but internet completely changed it. And uh, it was websites as Tutbuy, for example, which was banned two weeks ago, and YouTube that actually made all huge state TV uh, stations, channels, uh, in a way irrelevant and many people became uh, dependent right and uh, many people just started you know just started not to use their tv sets in their homes and that started just this summer and it was a huge change and the second of course you should it, i should speak about it of course telegram uh, it was the main tool that people used during the protests and people are still using. And uh, uh, as you might know, that actually uh, the protest was organized by uh, uh, young people who live in Warsaw in Poland uh, by Telegram. And uh, frankly speaking, it was... Uh, very weird feeling that when you are in the streets and Minsk, I was during this night on the streets, and when you just think that actually your actions are organized by a very young guy who is sitting somewhere and he just like, feel, oh, it's like, it's weird, you know? <laughs> and when it's, it's a very weird feeling when your 
in a way puppet master, can we can call it. He's actually he's the guy who, uh, I guess, ended his university just a year ago. So yeah, it's it was weird and, uh, but anyway. But anyway, if I if I may jump in, it, a lot yeah. of people seem to you know have followed. Uh, the call yeah. of these young people. So it was weird in one way. I understand, you know, the, the puppet master just created an image in my head, but at the same time, you and others followed their call. So there must have been some appeal to it. Um, and, and you know, speaking yeah. to the root causes of the uh, disappointment with the government. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that actually it's very difficult to understand why people followed. And maybe it wasn't about the telegram, it wasn't about these young people, it was just about the feeling that Lukashenko is no longer able to be a president and feeling that actually that Belarusian Democratic Movement won during the election and that's why people wanted to to actually, to, you know, to make it real, to take this victory from Lukashenko's hands. And uh, after that, there was uh, another issue, it was about violence. And many people were really uh, nervous about violence in, uh, that happened on, in Minsk, and that's why they started to actually to protest. It all, the, for many people, the primary reason was not falsific were not falsifications during the election night or or during the election day, but actually the violence that happened against people who were protesting against these falsifications. So, yeah, um, maybe I can continue to speak more about uh, some other tools that were used. Uh, I think that, that actually some of these tools are pretty simple. Uh, the first thing is, crowds, uh, is crowdfunding. And it was uh, actually, it wasn't popular during the, during the, I'm just sorry, can you please somehow unmute? Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that actually during this, uh, during the election uh, the campaign, crowdfunding became super popular in Belarus. It wasn't the case uh, before the election. There were many charities that used crowdfunding, but actually the sums that they were uh, gathering, they were not very ambitious, they were not large. But during this campaign, many people just started to give more and more and more money. And that's why it, it became a, a huge thing. And actually, this was the reason why the main uh, crowdfunding platforms were actually banned during the election uh, day. And after that, during the collection campaign and after that people started to use just Facebook and it was became super useful or PayPal. Uh, maybe, can I can I ask a question, Ria? Who were they giving yeah. money to? Who was crowdfunding for what? I mean, did people know who yeah. was behind this and what was you know people's motivation to give money? What what was the, the promise if they gave money? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that actually there were many different campaigns uh, uh, during this uh, during this time, and uh, many people started their own campaigns. Uh, but I think that there were just one main uh, platform. It's called right now by Soul Blues and Solidarity, and uh, actually the, it's it's still an issue, right? That how trust is built. Uh, through this digital technology that actually the person who is behind this foundation, the Russian Solidarity Fund, he's actually is not known in the country. And, uh, but at the same time, many people use that. And many people uh, trust to the platform, which I think that in a way, it's not transparent, right? And there are many issues about transparency in Belarus. If we speak about these digital solutions, digital tools that actually people are hiding because they should hide their identity because they are worried about repressions. And, but at the same time, still people trust each other in a way, and that's pretty unique for the country. But of course the police use this, right? It's, it's very difficult to actually, 
because, for example, I have many contacts on Telegram, but people are changing their names all the time there, and I don't know who's writing to me in a way every day. And it's like it's quite difficult to actually. You have to ask always, you know, some secret questions. When have we met? Something like that. It's it's very. Uh, it takes a lot of time, and uh, that's why it's still people are to build on their trust uh, uh, during the. Uh, in their communication, but when police started to actually to you know to hijack this communication, to try to become to use this telegram and say hello, I'm my name is like that, and I'm your friend, and could you please share your information? So it became a little bit nervous, and that's why people are just started not to share the private information, and that's why it's the the trust is eroding right now. And it's very actually difficult to, to rebuild this trust. So yeah, I hope I have answered you, 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 your question. <laughs> Maybe it was a little bit chaotic, sorry. Well, it's a, a <laughs> sort of a chaotic situation. We were just you know, very interested in hearing from someone who knows more than we do from media coverage. Uh, what I heard is that you know social media did play a role, uh, different platforms than some of us are familiar with, because we did hear about Telegram, which from a German perspective was, you know, um, unexpected because Telegram does not have the best reputation in Germany because here other groups are using it, not the like the peaceful protest movement uh, trying to overthrow a government that stole an election from them, but it's it's sort of the right wing, you know, group. So. Different countries, different media. That's that's very interesting. And uh, YouTube, and also the crowdfunding. And what I understand is that you know because of security issues, people try and stay anonymous. But the state or the authorities are now using that, you know, and trying to infiltrate the protest movement. So I I understand also being more cautious. Um, so thank you for sharing that for the beginning, um, Espen. Um, First, please tell us what your interest in internet and protest movement is, what your research encompasses, and how the experience from Rehor and people in Belarus we just heard mirrors some of your um, research recently. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so first, first of all, thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm I'm really happy to to be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to to the discussion and the conversation. So, I come in with a a different kind of perspective uh, than Rehor. Uh, I do research on these topics and it uh, mainly looks as, at patterns and trends over many countries and many years, sort of aiming to capture, capture the big picture. Um, and I'd like to, uh, to speak to some of the things that Rio said by highlighting maybe three three things from, from this emerging uh, research on, on digital technology and uh, and politics broadly, but but related to protest then. So and I, I think I'll start by basically stating the obvious. Uh, so it will be obvious for the people in, in here, but I would like to say that this technology in the recent decades, it has become a very important tool in the struggle for political power. And this is uh, not just sort of based on, on anecdotal um, sort of observation from, from my side, there's a growing sort of body of research that is demonstrating this. <clears throat> um, so governments and their political opponents, they try to use it to their advantage and their digital strategies and tactics, they really have real world consequences. So if you think about it in the context of a protest movement, uh, for example, Belarus today or Myanmar today, governments rely on, on censorship, disinformation and surveillance to try to stay in power and to fend off protest movements. And the protesters, they use this technology to coordinate and mo mobilize uh, in these two countries in an attempt to force the government out of power, right? And I'd like to speak a little bit to what Rihor said because it's really important that we remember that the technology is a tool, right? So the political grievances and the cleavages, they are underlying these struggles for power. As, as Rihor said also in Belarus, that the legitimacy of the regime is what is eroding. So it's, it's not the technology in itself. That's a tool for, for mobilization. 
Um, and then if we look at the impact of, of this technology on, on protest movements specifically, then at least the evidence from, from the research that I have, have been doing, uh, looking at many countries, many protest movements over a longer time period, then we see that the evidence suggests that the technology plays a role for sustaining and growing ongoing protest movement movements over time and space. Um, but in countries that are not democratic, uh, we see that um, these, these uh, forms of censorship and propaganda and surveillance, they actually reduce the chances of seeing protests start in the first place. But once they start, they, they keep on going and, and growing. And I think that this is an important distinction to, to take with us um, because it shows how the technology plays a role in the, these protest waves that we saw in 2019, for example. Um, and they show that it's not a simple relationship between digital technology and protest, right? Uh, it plays into the hands of di different actors, governments or opposition and different types of opposition actors. Like we said, in Germany, Telegram is used by completely different actors than they are in Belarus. So it plays into the ha hands of different actors at different times and under different conditions. Um, and if we look finally then, if we look even beyond sort of internet, uh, technology and protests. So one thing that, that was on the agenda in the 90s and, and 2000s and right after the Arab Spring was that many believe that, that this technology would empower democracy activists vis-a-vis -vis autocratic leaders, right? Um, but there's actually little systematic evidence that, that this technology leads to democracy, right? So Certainly it have, has had a major impact in some places, but if you look at it on a big picture, we don't see this, this clear relationship. So many leaders, they learn to, to use these tools uh, for their own uh, purposes. So, um, uh, and that's not just the research that, that I have, have looked at to myself and, and conducted, but if you think of organizations that follow the developments from year to year, um, they also point out sort of worrying trends in online freedom uh, that have implications for democracy. And not only the ones that are not democratic today, but also the one, the countries that are democratic today. So increased surveillance online, uh, new laws for regulating online speech, uh, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I, I'd like to sort of start there, and then I'm, I'm happy to to take it further with with questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the start. Um, I saw you nod at one point, Rio, and I want to get back to it when um, Espen mentioned that um, governments um, or no, let me phrase the question like this. You have a feeling that the current uh, Belarus government was sort of taken by surprise by the use of some of these platforms that you mentioned, so that they weren't surveilling them enough and they weren't prepared for what happened. But now they are prepared. As you mentioned, they are changing their tactics. They're you know entering conversations. And if they were taken by surprise, uh, why did that happen? I mean, weren't, you know, the Belarus government was before also known for quite tight surveillance, even though you said there weren't as many political prisoners as now. Um, or is the medium that you chose something that wasn't on their agenda, so they were taken by surprise by the medium that was used? Thanks a lot. Well, frankly speaking, I think that there is... Uh, a problem of thinking within the Lukashenko regime because actually they have too much power. And when you know that you can just shut down the whole internet, you start overthinking things that are happening on the internet. When you can just broke someone's hand to receive information from someone, you start overthinking how to actually how to steal someone's telephone and receive information or I don't know blackmail 
or something like that, when you actually just can torture people. So in a way, the reason why Lukashenko's regime became uh, so intellectually weak because it received a too much brutal power that actually make the system quite stupid. And this, I think that that's the, the main reason why they were not actually prepared. Maybe the second reason, the second explanation that actually no one was prepared. And it, it happened, for example, if we speak about the YouTube or Telegram, actually the growth of popularity of content that were produced by some Telegram channels or by YouTube channels, it, it happened too quickly, actually, to understand that. That's, that's I think, that was the second reason, a second explanation. What they are doing right now? Actually, they are, they started to do more surveillance. That's true, and they are quite well successful in that. But at the same time, it's I should say that without brutality, they would fail. But with a brutality, with using tortures, it actually yes, it's super easy, you know, to receive more information from people. And, uh, and uh, that's why they just, you know, for example, we had many issues about telephones and that actually when you are arrested, they just say to people who are arrested that they should unblock their telephones. And people just unblock them because they have no choice. Uh, so it, there are no super, you know, difficult uh, technologies if you can just force people to, to, to unblock their telephones. That's why I think that despite all this fact that I mentioned, that they are, despite saying that they are becoming more a little bit, you know, uh, specialized, more uh, smart about the surveillance, about uh, checking some trends on, uh, on internet, the main reason why they are successful in the repressing process is not about how smart they are, but actually how brutal they are. Mm -hmm. Aspen, you've done um, a research over, I think, more than 60 countries you mentioned, and I'm sure it's different in every country that you've researched, but are there some trends? Because we've seen more uh, politically motivated protests in the last decade. We've seen more um, online protests that are then taking offline? It's, or is it sometimes also the other way around that the protests are starting offline on the streets and then they're taking online? What's the trend from your research? Because in Belarus, it seemed to be like a combination. There were like root causes, root grievances with the government. It was a trigger moment, the elections, you know, combined with the COVID disappointment, the response from the government, as we always said, and then there was the availability of some platforms and that mobilized a lot of people to go out on the street. But does it also happen the other way around? People are on the street and then they're using social media? Uh, yes, so good good question. So um, I'm. this will be more, more spe speculation for, from my side on, on this point, but I think that there is a very, uh, there's going to be a lot of back and forth um, with going online and offline uh, with these protests. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to have to do with the resources that the protest movements have. It's going to have to do with how dangerous it is to go out into the streets, right? Like, uh, like the, the type of of brutal crackdowns that we're seeing in Belarus and we're seeing in Myanmar is going to make uh, some people are going to go out anyway, right? But it's going probably going to mobilize a lot more people and many of them may not want to go out into the streets, but they can still use uh, their digital tools uh, for activism, uh, which is not as visible uh, but I think also it's important to remember that we, uh, 
that we pay attention not only to what is going on in, in the streets. So what's going on in the streets is what is most visible to to us, um, right? And it's it's a very strong symbol, uh, especially when there is violence involved. But uh, these types of protest movements they have many many different elements, and they have many many different uh, tactics that they are using. Uh, so there are petitions, and there are strikes, and and there are sit-ins, and and so on and so forth. Um, and down even to to uh, smaller actions, right? In in some countries, they paint their roofs in a certain color, or they have uh, light uh, sort of turn off their lights for some periods of time, right? We we all know these different uh, tactics that are um, still visible, um, but not as dramatic or not as uh, as visible as a street protest. So, so I think that there's, uh, that was a long response to, to your answer, but, but I think that there's a lot, uh, a very dynamic relationship here between what's going on online and what's going on offline. You've already mentioned, um, you know, some of the violence uh, state inflicted, Myanmar, the crackdowns in Belarus and in other countries. Um, the question I was wondering about in preparing this conversation is um, how can protest movements prevent or counter um, this violence that is then also taking online, you know, the threats, the hate speech, um, and not, you know, have that endanger them even more or break down the protests, you know, if they want, if, if they um, use online platforms or tools. Any experiences from some of the countries that you studied? Um, so I know that uh, if we look at Myanmar, for example, um, when they were shutting down the internet connections uh, in the, in, during the nights, uh, so they've had these these uh, nightly curfews, uh, and then um, from from the reports that I that I know, sort of this, of course, heightens insecurity a lot because they cannot really communicate uh, as well, and they, there's uh, a lot of fear. Right? This is, this is fear tactics. You're taking away information, so you won't know where where the regime will will strike. Um, and so, but I think that many of them, they actually got together physically then to have some sort of network to, to stay together uh, and support each other. Uh, and I think that the, the, the key, um, the key um, sort of way to not have violence escalate is to stick to the nonviolent discipline, right? Which is extremely, extremely tough. And, and it's almost, um, uh, it's almost impossible to sort of say that, right? In, in these types of contexts where there is so much violence against the protesters. But if you look at some of the research that is being done, we also see that the more violence is coming out of the protester side, uh, the worse the counter violence becomes from the government. So um, that's uh, that's sort of one way to to keep the violence maybe at a low level. Although in some countries, if you look at if you look at Myanmar, I mean the violence has been uh, has been uh, very high. Uh, there's been a very brutal repressive crackdown there, despite. The, that um, the protesters have been uh, nonviolent overall. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's one, one good reason to, to stick uh, to the nonviolent discipline. Of course, th where the line is for, for what is nonviolent in a situation like this is, is uh, quite, quite blurry, right? Um, but what, another risk, of if, if violence escalates from the protester side is also that some negative international attention uh, might come up, right? Which also harms the movement, which might 
demoralize uh, the mo the movement. So, so there's a lot to to gain, I think, from that side. Although, yeah. Um, Leo, you mentioned you know some of the brutality of the Lukashenko regime, and we've been we've been reading um, about you know more and more arrests and political prisoners. We've been reading about more people leaving the country and trying to keep the protest up from outside. What do you think um, could be uh, the role of some external actors to sort of mediate in this environment? Um, also, you know, respecting some of the the internal fears that people have and maybe influencing the dialogue also online, you know, towards a more, um, how do I say that? Like finding results, finding solutions to the situation, or is that something that only can come within the Belarus um, population and government? You know, the EU just, had new sanctions on Belarus. Um, does that help or does it make it more difficult for the protest movement? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. You're still muted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, like, if you speak about Belarusian perspective, perspective, it looks that actually external actors are not very important. Maybe the West is less even important. Russia is more important, of course. And many people just think that actually, if we, I can continue Aspen's idea, right, about this nonviolent protests and etc. Many people are disappointed in Belarus with nonviolent protests because they think that actually they face brutality anyway. So why to be nonviolent? And what the whole point you know, of being nonviolent all the time? If whatever you do, actually what, whatever Lukashenko does, Russia will still support him. Whatever you do or whatever Lukashenko does, the West will not be able to do anything with Lukashenko or somehow, you know, help you inside the country. That's why many people are right now disappointed with, with non-violence, with uh, actually seeing that that while being super non-violent, actually, the Russian revolution was really nice. I mean, it, it looked very nice, all these women marches, it looked fantastic. And uh, I as participant, I, I saw it, it was really great. It was uh, nice to see, but at the same time, it's obvious that the revolution has failed. And uh, it's obvious that many people have died despite being nonviolent. And uh, despite being nonviolent, we have hundreds of political prisoners and thousands went through tortures. And after that, when people say that, well, you should stay nonviolent, it looks a little bit, really? We were nonviolent for a year and it went nowhere. And why, sh you know, and that's why people are really disappointed with this, with these norms of nonviolence. And when you speak about the external actors, uh, of course, the West can do a lot of things. Yeah, of course, I think that actually, uh, maybe most of the things the West cannot do because they should have done, you know, in autumn or last August. Right now, it's quite difficult, you know, to actually to help protest movement because actually people are already in prison so, or emigrated, so it's there are not so many people whom you can support politically right now inside the country. Uh, but there are still many things that the West can do. I think that the, even before starting doing something, I think one of the key problems that the West has right now with Belarus, that actually it's very difficult to understand who is responsible for Belarus in the West. I mean, like it's it's... It's important for Lithuania and for Poland because they are geographical neighbors and they like have more connections with Belarus. But at the same time, other states from the Western part of, of the West, 
they're not super connected with Belarus and they just do not feel that it's an important part of their policies towards Belarus. Uh, so they do not feel connected. Uh, the US is also, uh, I think that the US is a little bit annoyed about the EU and that the EU can't do anything mean, meaningful with the with Lukashenko, but at the same time, they are not very interested in, in doing something by themselves because they think that it's an European matter. So I think that the first issue is actually to make someone responsible for Belarus. That will be much, that will make things a little bit easier. The other thing that the West should do is, of course, to broaden um, sanctions, but these sanctions should be against specific people and against specific uh, organizations that are involved in uh, political repressions inside the country. And uh, I do not think that sectoral sanctions are, are, is a good idea. They should be more focused on specific people and specific organizations. Uh, of course, the West can support the, the independent media and the civil society inside the country and outside the country. And that's, unfortunately, it needs a lot of money right now. Because, for example, this the most popular website, which is stood by, which was banned two or three weeks ago, it's quite huge, frankly speaking. It was the most popular website and it has uh, or had... Uh, 250 workers there. So right now, many people are just don't know how to actually to support that. You know, you should pay for 250 people. It's like <laughs> maybe the West doesn't have much enough money for that. And that's a huge dilemma, huge challenge. Of course, many other things that should be done is just to support political movement that the, uh, Belarus has. It's like, I think that it, it's very important that Svetlana Tsikhanovska has so many meetings with presidents, with prime ministers in the West, and it's 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 really great. Of course, so I think that's the, the main issue that Belarus has right now with the Western policies. Of course, there is a strong need to propose some, uh, uh, let's say, some kind of martial plans for Belarus because many people feel a little bit relieved that maybe somewhere and maybe maybe in the future they will have a, an, another chance that, that they would like to use i think that there is a still a conversation about in, among policymakers what to do with russia in this context because it's obvious that russia supports lukashenko but at the same time russia uh, may play a constructive role who knows? Actually, it's 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 not very likely. Let's say frankly, but there is a still need to actually to do something with Russia. You either should either you know say that the, you will sanction the Russian economic enterprises or uh, political actors, or just try to actually to negotiate with Russia. So it's a huge issue, but at the same time, the West. Is, is supposed somehow to answer that and uh, to make it clear that, uh, that and this crisis also involves Russia. And uh, mm -hmm. in a way, it's very difficult to actually to, to deal with it without them. Thank you for giving us some insight into a very complex situation, you know, looking at it from the outside. Mm -hmm.